Well, thank you for coming once again here now for the Mises Circle. And we want to apologize again for the mix-up that, as um, Tom Woods alluded to with his presentation last night, normally we're supposed to hold these things out there, and it's a lot more relaxed. I think cool was his word. And the, the reason for that we're in here, I believe, just because of a mix-up, and we, they had to postpone dinner. I'm not sure. But anyway, we're here, and I, I feel bad because I saw some people really hours before this was supposed to happen were out there camped out trying to get the choice seats to be able to look down, um, you know, get a good view of my bald spot. And, and, and then, of course, now their plans were, uh, were dashed. And it, re it reminded me of when I was at a grad student at NYU, we were going to go see the fireworks on the 4th of July, and they were going to be shot off of you know, the New York Harbor Battery Park. So we took the subway down there, and we get out there, and there were already, you know, we'd gotten there, let's say, a half an hour before they were supposed to begin. And there already literally were thousands of people there because we didn't know where to go. We come out of the subway station and we look around and we just see all these people lined up looking out into the harbor the certain way. So naturally we thought, oh, it's going to be over here and we get there. And there were people up in the front like with the best seats that we, you know, had lawn chairs and they had coolers and they were already half drunk just waiting. You know, they had clearly been there for hours. And then, as you, you can see where the store is going, the fireworks start going off, and they're all behind us. And so everyone, you know, the first few people who showed up were just wrong, and then the thousands of people that came just assumed, well, these guys wouldn't be so stupid as to... And so, and I, I probably made some joke about irrational expectations, and, you know, it's a, when you're in grad school, you, you do that. Everything revolves around what you're studying. So, as, a, as the, the title for tonight's lecture is, I believe it's How I Bamboozled thousands of conservatives into thinking like anarchists, and I'm, I'm sure what, that, what they want me to talk about is my book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Capitalism. But before I get into that, I want to just sort of explain my relationship with modern day conservatives. And of course, already I know if somebody's listening online, they're going to email me or someone's going to pounce on me during the social hour. And so you shouldn't have called them conservatives because they're not conservatives, they're really neocons. And I'm just in the interest of brevity, I'm not going to keep using the term neoconservative, but just so you understand, Right now, I realize that they're not true conservatives with the way I use that term, that they're not people who necessarily believe in the principles that used to uphold this country. But we all know what I mean. People who listen to Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, those are the people I mean when I'm saying conservative for the rest of, of the talk tonight. And as I should say, I used to be one of them. I don't think I ever considered myself a Republican with a capital R, but I certainly at one point in my life, I think early on in high school, thought I was a conservative or I would have identified myself as that. My dad listened to Rush Limbaugh, and, and so did I. And, and then I think at some point I, I switched and realized, no, no, actually I'm a libertarian. And then it was in college when I finally took the plunge in the deep end and said, no, I'm an anarcho-capitalist. And, um, you know, there was 15 people in the world who knew what that term meant. So it was kind of safe at the time. <laughs> you know, people would just think there was some sort of medical condition. But, um, <laughs> so, so anyway, I just... In case there are conservatives listening to this and they think that, you know, I wouldn't have chosen the term bamboozle. I would have used hoodwinked or something like that. <laughs> um, it's, again, this, this really is in the spirit. I, I don't think that I'm, I'm trying to be deceptive or anything. And, and you'll see that come out in the talk. But I just want to stay at the, up, at the outset that I, uh, I, do have, I am friendly with modern-day conservatives. Some of them are in my, in my family and my, my, my friends. So, as I say, I liked Rush Limbaugh. I even listen to him now. And it's funny, it's, it's not that I even disagree with all that much of what he says. Uh, this, this stuff on the, the Iraqi uh, abuses with the you know, Abu Ghraib and things like that, where he was saying, oh, come on, these troops are just blowing off steam. Obviously, that I, I just was shocked that he was saying that. But when you hear him saying it, you, know, you, can, you can picture it and say, yeah, that, that is, I could see him saying that. Now, you know, like when you read it in print, it's shocking. And then when you hear the way it actually came out on the air, it's like, yeah, that, that was Rush, OK. Um, but it's even now listening to him and all the things, what he does, like with the attorney general stuff, if, if those of you who have been following that, I mean, it's really funny if you catch these senators grilling the guy. I mean, Gonzalez, he's, he'll, he'll say, um, what was the one? It was really hilarious. They had, they had clips, of course, on NPR because they're so anti Gonzalez there. But he, he said something, you know, they, they said, you said that when you went to this guy's hospital room, it wasn't about this certain matter. And, but it turned out it was. And he said, yes, well, I clarified with the report, uh, reporter soon after that. And, and so I clarified. I said, OK, well, what exactly did you say to the reporter? And he said, well, I didn't speak with the reporter. And I said, OK, what did your spokesperson say to the reporter? And he said, I don't know. And then I'm not making this up. This is almost verbatim. And, then, and, it, and so then I said, well, then how, you know, how do you know that he clarified? The, and, okay, So that's the kind of thing. And you could actually hear these senators just sighing and like sort of guffawing. And that's, that's pretty good when you can get senators to say, what a liar this guy is, you know, so. 
So that's always impressive. So anyway, but the, my point is with Rush, you know, his commentary on this, it's not that he's so much defending Gonzalez's statements, but he'll, he'll say, can you believe these Democrats? Look at Janet Reno, look, and he'll go through all the Democratic attorneys general and, and, and show how they're hypocritical for attacking the Republicans, which generally is true. So it's, it's just funny that, you know, these, the conservatives, a lot of what they, they write, you know, if you go to their websites or whatever, a lot of it I actually agree with. It's just they're so focused on it's us versus them. And if my opponent is wrong on something, if, if uh, Ted Kennedy is on the opposite side of the issue on something, then that means I must be right. And that's their mentality. And of course, that's the kind of thing that I think places like the Mises Institute needs to combat, that we need to show uh, Americans and everyone else around the world that no, there is, there is a different option. There's things to choose between what US Republicans and US Democrats are offering us. Now, if I'm talking about my relationship with conservatives, I can't skip over the episode with Jonah Goldberg. And uh, so let me just briefly recapitulate what happened there. Some of you uh, may, have, may remember what I'm talking about when my, from my sort of angry young man days when I used to start writing for LouRockwell.com. What had happened was Jonah Goldberg, who's the editor of National Review Online, he wrote a piece called, I think it was Libertarians Under My Skin. And he just had to get it off his chest because these you know, idiot libertarians over here, I mean, they, you don't need to take them seriously, but he was so well informed he was going to let his readers know about us. And he starts out the piece and says, so there's this site, LouRockwell.com. You haven't heard of it? Well, most people haven't either. And then he proceeded to go, go from there. And he was criticizing, I don't even, it was, the issue was about Hayek, or it was some, some um, abstruse point about Straussians and Hayek, I think, and whether he was a conservative or not. And that's what they're talking about. But the thing that really just annoyed me was, first of all, he was attacking Gene Callahan, who's my personal friend. And as I told Gene after the fact, I said, you know, in a physical fight, if someone goes up to you, I'm not going to be anywhere near you, but if someone, you know, fights you on the internet, I got your back. I'm right there. <laughs> you know, so, so, that, so, that was, so that was one thing, was just that he was attacking Gene. And, but the, and, and just, again, you would need to go. It, it's on. You can find it if you want to. It's still online somewhere, or at least you can find my article that quotes from it if you want to see exactly what set me off so much. But it was just, he, so he was attacking Callan and, and just the very idea that, that Jonah Goldberg thought that he was more politically sophisticated and he knew political theory more than these children over at LRC. And you say, we, we, we put children. No, he was calling, he was saying things like, these libertarians are in their high chair and slamming on it and saying, we want liberty now. Eh. Like th these are the types of uh, reasons, arguments that he was using against us. So you can see it got me mad. And the thing, though, bit more than him attacking Gene, because, you know, Gene a lot of times says things that would provoke attacks. Um, the thing that, that really got me mad, though, was that Jonah Goldberg thought that he was witty and he thought he was cooler than the people writing for LRC when we're all just complete nerds. Right? That, I mean, it's, it's not like he was, he was the editor of Playboy or something. You know, he's the editor of National Review Online. If you're, if you're going to sell out, you might as well get money and power. Don't become the editor of National Review Online. So that, that's what my take was on that. So that, that, that's why, um, and, and then, so I had my response. And I, I don't think it's on in my archives right now because of, as I got older and, and looked back at some of my youthful indiscretions, I, I asked people, let's, let's put some of this aside. But, if you do come up to me afterward, I'll tell you there is a way you can read these things um, online still, but you've got to know the secret password. So I'll, I will tell you afterward, but I don't want to broadcast it to the whole world as to how to find this stuff. But in any event, in response to that, Jonah Goldberg, and this is probably my proudest moment, my, well, I mean, my, my wedding and the birth of my son. And then number three, <laughs> number three is when Jonah Goldberg on National Review Online referred to my, me, you know, Bob Murphy, and called me a no-talent ass clown. And, <laughs> and you know, as, as, as I said, yeah, thank you. So it, it, it insulted me because I told me, I said, I'm not a clown. You know, that's just. <laughs> and then, but what's funny is this, this just epitomizes the difference because Someone pointed out to me later, he said, you realize that Jonah Goldberg took that from um, Office Space, the movie Office Space. He didn't invent that term. So here I was thinking, OK, that's kind of a clever term. you know? Okay. And he took it from a movie. All right? So that, I mean, doesn't that just epitomize that you know, here we are in this, this brawl of words, and then he's going to use a, a term that he just stole from a, a fairly popular movie? Whereas you know, if, if Gene Callahan were going to criticize him and use a term, he would have picked something obscure from page 340 of Ulysses or something you know, that David Gordon would take two weeks and go, oh, I get the joke. Right? That, that's, that's the difference between Gene Callahan and Jonah Goldberg. And that's, it was just, I was just so mad because Jonah wouldn't even get it. You know, he wouldn't even see the difference. So anyway, OK, I'll move on. So as far as 
my personal progression, you know, what, what is it about the conservatives? When did I actually break with them and realize that, no, I, I can't identify myself with these guys? I mean, besides, um, let's say, the, the doctrine, of course, I had moved beyond being uh, calling myself a conservative and even a libertarian, and I, and I realized that, no, I'm an anarchist of the variety of Murray Rothbard and people in that tradition. But the thing that really made me realize that, oh, wow, the, the right, in terms of a, a modern American politics, really, I don't know if if I side with them anymore. Because it used to be that I would say, okay, I, I don't like the spectrum the way it is, but I mean, come on, those Democrats are just crazy and they're, they're thieves and liars. Whereas the Republicans, yeah, they sell out and they don't actually live up to their ideals, but at least I like their rhetoric. And so I, I, I'm ashamed to say, I don't think I actually prayed for it just because that seems so unseemly to pray for a political outcome. But I was really nervous when I went to bed when um, George Bush and Al Gore, when that was still up in the air, because I was so terrified that if Al Gore won, we would just have all this environmental legislation and that would cripple U.S. industry. And uh, as you can imagine now in retrospect, maybe that wouldn't have been such a bad thing had, had George Bush lost that first election. But so, so I'm just trying to show you my mentality. And at that point, of course, I was still a, uh, I was an anarcho-capitalist, but yet I was still rooting for the Republican in that particular race. So what really turned me around, and the Bush illusion would, would let you realize this, was the whole Iraq invasion and, and the WMD issue. And I, again, this is so naive to, to admit this, that I, I was so naive at the time, but when it was leading up to the invasion and Bush and his subordinates were saying how we have all this credible intelligence about Iraq's WMDs, I totally believed that. And I just thought the issue was, I said, OK, I'm going to right now use this as a litmus uh, test to see is the U.S. really this domineering foreign power, this imperialist power that the left says it is, or are we basically the good guys and sometimes we go too far and we overstep, but we're basically still, you know, the free freedom fighters of the world kind of thing. And so I said, okay, if, if it looks like to me that Saddam Hussein really does try to do what the U.S. wants and turns over his weapons and then, you know, and the, we avert war, then I'll say that the U.S. is basically the good guys, whereas if it looks like, um, you know, the United States invades when Saddam did what he could to try to, you know, turn over the weapons, let inspectors through. Then I'm going to uh, think that the U.S. are the bad guys, just like the left says. And so you can imagine, it didn't occur to me, well, wait a minute, what if there are no weapons? What, what happens then? What does that make the U.S. if we invade when there are no weapons in the first place? Because I thought the issue was, okay, they've got weapons, and do we invade or not? Because they might at some point use them against us. And I thought, well, no, we shouldn't, but let's see how it plays out. So, and, and if you, just to, to, um, defend myself a little bit. It wasn't that I thought the U.S. president and his advisors were above lying. It's that I thought, well, if you took over another country based on reasons that turned out to be dead wrong, you would probably get in trouble. Like, something would happen to you, wouldn't it? And, like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that, surely. And it turns out, well, no, nothing would happen to you. You get reelected. That's what happens. So, so that that's the, was the flaw in my reasoning, is I didn't take the analysis far enough, and I, I just assumed that the American people surely wouldn't reelect somebody who uh, led them into war on the basis of things that turned out to be wrong, whether you thought they were lies or not. You know, that, that's the thing. What's funny too is how the conservatives spin that and say, you know, every other agency thought that. And well, okay, but you know, when it comes to things like when, when the left makes arguments about, well, every other European country has much higher taxes on gasoline. Of course, the right's response is, well, we don't want to be like those idiot Europeans. You know, like if the French have more syphilis than we do too, ha, ha, ha. You know, we don't want to copy them. But yet, that's exactly the argument they use. And I don't know if the French do or not. I'm just. You know. <laughs> All right. So, but that's, you see what I'm saying? That that sort of, and that's, that's just a throw off line. And, you know, that's, it's stupid when the left uses arguments about comparing us to the rest of the world. But yet, when we want to explain, well, gee, why did we just take over this country on things for reasons that turned out to be completely wrong? That's not an indictment of our intelligence agencies. That's just, well, it's not our, I mean, everybody else thought that too. Right? So at any event, that's, um, that's what really turned me around the WMD thing and, and why I, I started to agree with the left. And so now it's, you know, I can listen to NPR, whereas before I hated NPR. You know, Terry Gross just turns my stomach and I can't stand these people. But now it's, eh, you know, and it's, it's really, it's just interesting. When you see, I, I'm grateful in that sense that, that I've, I've lived through this because now I, I can see the merits in both sides. So just like I can understand now where conservatives are coming from when they rail against the welfare policies of the left by the same token, I totally get now when I lib listen to a quote unquote liberal commentator and how they rail against the religious right and, and Bush's America and fascism and things like that, I, I see where they're coming from too. So it's, it was sort of an educational experience. 
One last thing I want to point out about the, the similarities between the, the pundits defending Bush. What, what, I, what I noticed is with this WMD issue that they saw it coming. So at first, when we went in there and we didn't find any weapons and Rumsfeld was saying things like, you know, at press conferences, they'd say, where are the WMD? And he said, we know where they are. They're, they're around Tikrit and they're, you know, north of bases in Tikrit. We have solid evidence. Of course, they're not going to have them right on the border when we first cross into there. It's going to take a while. And they would say stuff like, you know, look at Iraq's the size of, and they compare it to U.S. states and say, do you think you could go find weapons in two days in the state this size? And, and so they would, they would just you know, keep laughing at the, at the left and these, these lunatics for expecting so much from the U.S. troops and don't worry, it'll turn up. But as the months passed on, the, I think the, you know, the right-wing pundits, they started to realize, well, wait a minute, we need to uh, change our position because this is, at some point, we're going to have to admit there are no weapons there. And so it, it's just interesting how it morphed over time. And I, I, um, I do have it, I don't, like I said, I don't think it's online right now, but in, in a series of our, a Lou Rockwell article, I did point out, I, I caught this guy, I think it was National Review Online writer, he wasn't like their regular, it was one of the, the guys that they had occasionally, and he had an article, um, I think it was Clifford May, but I'm not sure, but I think it was him, it was one week to the next, like literally, I think seven days had elapsed, and he was talking about the, uh, the yellow cake, uranium, and all that issue, and it was it was amazing how the first week's column it was just totally against what these liberal democrats were talking about and just complete you know the administration's been completely exonerated on this and these these idiot anti-war leftists are just hurting our troops cause over there and, and uh, demoralizing the troops and then one week later he like toned everything down by 10% on all his points and then like opened up the door so that in the future it could just be totally, yeah, we knew all about that stuff and no one had ever said otherwise. And you know, so that, that's the way it worked. And it, was, it struck me that it was exactly similar to what the leftist pundits did during the Clinton administration when the Monica Lewinsky stuff came out. Because if you remember, right when those allegations were first made and Clinton denied it famously saying, you know, I didn't have relations with, those, with that woman. Um, the, you know, the, the leftist pundits were, they were just all over the place. They were saying things like, oh, come on, you right-wing conspiracy. Like Clinton's a very charming man. Do you really think he would have picked that intern to have an affair with if he wanted to have an affair with? I mean, they were saying stuff like this. Like, just, it was ludicrous, and it was just a right-wing conspiracy. But then, as time went on, and, you know, they started getting all that hard evidence, um, they just said, okay, we're going to have to do something about this. We can't just flip one day to the next and say, yeah, he did it. Like, so they started morphing it over time and saying things, well, these, you know, and eventually, of course, their position was this doesn't rise to the level of an impeachable offense, and these, you know, right-wingers are, are concerned about sexual immorality, whereas look at all the... You know, prime ministers in Europe and so on who have mistresses, right? You mean, do you remember this stuff? How that's not what they said initially. They didn't say initially, well, whether he had the affair or not, it's not a big deal. No, they didn't. They denied, he said he did not have that affair because he said he didn't. You guys have no proof. This is crazy. And then once they realized, wait, he probably did, or they knew, okay, he did, we got to do something, they just slowly morphed their position, their defense of him, into what is now in the history books. And so the, the right wing pun is the exact same thing with this WMD issue that if you went back and read what they initially said, they weren't saying things like, whether or not Saddam has WMD, we needed to invade to give Iraqis freedom and to depose Saddam Hussein, and he posed it. They didn't say that. They said, no, there's WMD, clearly. The president said it in the State of the Union, da da da, da. And then it was only months and months later that they realized, okay, we need to change what the, the rhetorical justification for the invasion was. So again, all the... It, it really, and I, this is so cliche, and people who are older and already knew this are going to think, well, why are you harping on this? But again, it just really, it was a learning experience for me that all the reasons I didn't like the left, the right does the exact same thing for their own pet projects. And it's really, it's an interesting comparison, if you just go through it, that what is it that the left does? They advocate, of course, government power and money for their pet projects. They think that they're smart enough and that they have the right to take your money and spend it on projects they want to remake society. And as we know, as, as Austrian economists, the things that they're trying to fix, the social problems that they're trying to fix, are actually caused by previous such interventions in the first place. Right? And when, I'm not going to bother going through it because you guys are familiar with it. But the right does the exact same thing. That It's just they care about defense issues, not social issues. And so they are extremely arrogant and naive, and they think that with the power of Washington, D.C., we can remake the Middle East. I mean, they actually think that that's going to work, and they're not afraid to go in there and try to remake it, just like the left isn't afraid to try to go in and remake an inner city. 
and their proposals, again, with the solution to everything is always, we'll just increase our budget. We just need to do more of the same. We didn't have enough money last time. Or so-and-so you know, stabbed us in the back, and that would have worked, except for we didn't have the right people in charge. If only we had a different general, then it would have worked. Right? That's their mentality, the same way the left thinks that, yeah, there's nothing wrong with inner city housing projects. It's just a particular person who was in charge was corrupt, and he didn't uh, oversee the, the construction properly, but we'll just get the right person in there. We'll build some more. Right, so that's, that's their mentality. And again, the things that we're trying to fix, the fact that, wow, these people around the world hate us so much, and we're just sitting there minding our own business, and then all of a sudden Japan attacks us out of nowhere, and then, so, okay, we've got to reluctantly go over there and take over Europe and, and uh, you know, put troops over there, and then we're just minding our own business. Again, all of a sudden these crazy Arabs come and bomb us. Well, okay, we've got to go over there and, and fix the Middle East and, you know, and all these terrorists. So all these issues you can, again, go through and, and see that it's precisely because of prior interventions that are causing or at least exacerbating the things that now allegedly require a response from our military. So it's, again, it's, it's very interesting. And I like to just tell people that what's, what's the stereotype of American politicians in terms of Republicans and Democrats? It's that the Democrats are uh, weak on defense. You know, they're very pacifistic, but they like to spend a lot on social programs. And they're very interventionist in terms of the domestic economy whereas the Republicans are supposed to be the opposite. They're big war hawks. They go around blowing people up, but they um, are at least good in, in terms of free market economics. But if you say, that, okay, well, which, you know, wh who were the presidents that were the biggest warmongers in the 20th century? You start listing them, they're all Democrats. I mean, who is the, the one political ruler in human history who's used nuclear weapons against innocent civilians was a Democrat. And in terms of the Republicans, Richard Nixon, what did he do? He took us off the gold standard. He imposed peacetime wage and price controls, and, and then and he visited China, right? So it's just funny that when you, the stereotypes we had, they're not even right or correct, you know? So it's, it's just really frustrating. And when you realize that, it's, uh, it makes you want to go vote for Ron Paul. But, <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, that was a throwaway. That's like, how you doing, Auburn? All right. It's good to be here. You guys got a good football team, huh? So. All right, so I should probably talk about my book at least a little bit. So The Politically Incorrect Guide to Capitalism. Uh, what I did there, and I, I, th I think this is where the title for tonight's talk is coming from, is, of course, that was addressed to a modern conservative audience. And you know, when I was at Regnery, the publishers sitting at the table where they were debating whether they were going to publish it or not, you know, I was looking around and at the on the bookshelves, you know, there was Ann Coulter's latest book and there was all this stuff, you know, and and, it, and Newt Gingrich and things like that. And I was I was really it, it was kind of scary because I so much wanted this them to agree to the book project. I mean, if they had said, well, are you going to pledge your personal loyalty to Dick Cheney? I would have said, sure thing, sure thing. Just you know, <laughs> give me a book. Um, and so it, it, was, it was sort of scary, I'm not going to lie to you. But, uh, so, so don't ever give me that ring from Lord of the Rings because I don't know what I would do with it. <laughs> but so, so it, it, but I, I, I will say, and I was nervous that they were going to pressure me to put stuff in the book that I didn't agree with. And, it, and I, I'm glad to say that didn't happen, that uh, all jokes aside, I really did have a, a very nice relationship and I had smooth sailing with, with their editors. Um, they, they did take some things out, but I think most of it was just because of space constraints and, and, and just I didn't, you know, I, I was making it too geeky and they had to, they had to take stuff out. Um, the, there are two things I'll mention that, that didn't make it into the book. One of them, I think, was just, again, because of, of space constraints. The other one may have been because they thought their audience wouldn't go for it. Um, so the, the first one, I think, was just space constraints was in the, ch the chapter on slavery, which, I, to their credit, I couldn't believe they let me put in a chapter not defending slavery, but blaming slavery on the government and saying under a free market there wouldn't be slavery. Because that's, that's pretty politically incorrect. You know, that's, that's pretty crazy to be talking about that. You would think they would say, well, let's talk. And it's also very uh, abstract and sort of hyper, you know, that's, that's something that happened in the past. It's opposed to talking about reparations or something. That's more mainstream. But I was here talking about slavery. And like I said, to their credit, they, they didn't chop that chapter out. But what they did take out was this good quote by Gordon Tullock, and again, I think it was just because it was too long, but he went through, and I, and I got a lot of this stuff uh, from Mark Thornton's paper, and, and I do quote from him heavily in the chapter, but I just want it, to, it's very interesting, the, the more research I did, the more convinced I became that, yes, slavery really could not last under a, a free market. Now, there's the sort of tautology where you could say, well, 
if you had slavery, it's not what I mean by a free market. I mean, so there's, there's that obvious sense. But even beyond that, if you had a, a, a laissez-faire economy where it just so happened that the way people thought that they thought people could own cows and they thought people could own houses and they also thought that this group of people had the legal ability to own this group of people over here and that's the way it started in the beginning at time zero just over time if you from that point on had strict enforcement of property rights and everything were voluntary given that definition it's it's really inconceivable that over time those people wouldn't end up owning themselves right so that they would have self-ownership now you could say it would be it's unfair that they would have to buy themselves out of slavery but that's clearly the only efficient outcome and Mises talks about this in human action but it's a little bit um, oblique it's, it's, it's hard he doesn't come out and say it as clearly as Tullock had done in this in this passage that I quoted but just to, to recapitulate the argument it goes like this that the difference between human beings and animals like uh, donkeys or whatever the animals that you're going to have doing work around a, a, a plantation is that the human beings are actually they're, they're not very f physically strong a lot of their contribution comes in from the fact that they're intelligent and so unfortunately it's hard just from looking at somebody to tell how what their capabilities are and, and even beyond just mere intelligence just you know your attitude or just if whether you're clever or not just if you have an aptitude for whatever the the, the problem is to be solved on the plantation or whatever the job happens to be and so looking at a group of people if, if you picture if you're a slave owner and you're going to use force to motivate them to to work for you what do you have to do you have to set a bare minimum and say if you do let's say it's picking cotton if you pick less cotton than this bare amount then i'm going to whip you or whatever the punishment's going to be and of course they can set different standards looking at you that if you're a 25 year old male and you're physically strong they might expect you to pick more to avoid a whipping than you know some woman who's nine months pregnant okay fair enough the, but the point is even among males who are of comparable build and they're both healthy one of them might be just a much harder worker if he had the right incentives whereas under the slave system he's just gonna do the bare minimum he needs in order to avoid the physical punishment and so if somebody down the street says to the first uh, plantation owner he says okay why don't I rent from you some of your slaves but I don't want all of them let me ask them. I'm going to come up with a proposal and say to them, I'll tell you what, I'll um, rent your services from your owner. And if, and, and so let's say they're picking whatever it is, 100 bushels of cotton for whatever the time frame is to make that feasible. And I expect you to pick 120. But if you do that, and you're going to volunteer, self select yourselves and volunteer for this proposal, if you do that, then um, not only are you going to avoid a whipping, but I'll also give you more food or I'll do whatever it is that they, they would, would value and so they sort of pay them to volunteer to come forward and so if you think about that and it would be worthwhile to the the original owner because this person would say to him and I'll pay you for that I'll, I'll rent them out for more than it's worth to you than what they're contributing with your current system where you're just punishing them all right so if you think it through like that that it's eventually um, you wouldn't have this the system the way it originally was set up and over time of course you would have the slaves would just would just buy their freedom from from their original owner and again you could say that's not fair they shouldn't have to do that but the point is they wouldn't persist there wouldn't be generations of slavery that couldn't possibly persist now you could say well why didn't that happen in the real world and, and we do address I do address this in the book and Mark Thornton's article talks about it is because the government had laws restricting manumission for one thing a lot of owners when on their deathbed they would you know in their will they would say I'm gonna give the farm to my, my children according to these proportions and a lot of the times they would want to free their most trusted servants and you know give them their freedom that was what they did on their deathbed and there were laws restricting that there were also laws restricting educating your slaves because if you think about it in terms of just pure profit and loss if everything is private property but it has ownership of other human beings certainly it's going to be in every plantation owner's interest to educate his own slaves now what happens is the, the government and the you know the wise men of the town sat back and they realized well wait a minute if we've got all these slaves who now can read and write they're going to get funny ideas in their head and this is going to be a nightmare down the road so let's just prevent everybody from educating their slaves but you can see that would never have happened if you didn't have government interfering with the rights of property owners to teach their property how to read and write okay so it's just it's people don't realize that they think that it's a perverse outcome of the free market that you had human slavery but no it's 
actually because of restrictions of those property rights which we are offensive to us that perpetuated the entire system. So that was one thing, and like I said, uh, they did leave most of the chapter intact, but I, I really, in the, in the initial manuscript, had really driven home the economics behind it, but I think they thought that was a bit too highbrow. Uh, the other thing where I suspect they may have pulled it because of their intended audience was I had, in the, in the beginning, the first chapter, I think, I had a section called, We Won the Cold War, or Did We? And what I was going through there was to point out that capitalism has just hands down been the most successful system and we beat the Soviets and you think that we would be cheering ourselves and patting ourselves on the back and just you know saying hey our way of life is better but of course that's not what happened we still have in major universities socialists and and people make apologies for the Soviet Union and say well it's because they had bad people in charge but it really was a nice idea and one of the ways I went to illustrate that so this is where you could say I was trying to bamboozle the conservative is I was trying to get them to realize that our way of life is so much better than those idiot Soviets that our military could have kicked their butt, you know? And, and so that, that's, on the one hand, it appeals to their um, patriotism that, yeah, we know, it's, it's sort of like in Dr. Strangelove, if you remember the scene where, um, uh, it's not Jack Ripper, what's the other guy? Does anyone remember? The other, the other general, um, but anyway, he's, He's talking to the president, and he's saying, "I mean, you can't expect these these Russians to know how to operate anti-aircraft machinery." And he's and he's like really just criticizing these poor peasant Soviets compared to our boys flying the bombers over there. When throughout the whole movie, he had been the biggest hawk about how we need to build up our defense because these Soviets could invade us at any minute. And I think that tension exists in the modern conservative mind. That on the one hand, they really want to uh, praise our you know, U.S. military might and there's our economy is the best system and our government is much better than that, that system they have over there and yet we have to be ever vigilant because we're at any day now we're at the mercy of being invaded and taken over by these people. And so that's what I was trying to do and I had a quote from Daniel Ellsberg who was the author of the Pentagon Papers or the one who released the Pentagon Papers to the public and so I, and I think that's why this, this quote may have gotten next because he's a, a sort of a dirty name for a lot of right wingers because he's associated with selling us out in the Vietnam War and things like that. But he had this great quote where he was talking about the missile gap. And that was something where in the 1950s, you know, the CIA had these reports and the Pentagon was concerned that the United States had this, I think it was 10 to 1 missile gap with the Soviet Union where they thought the Soviets had ICBMs 10 times in excess of what the U.S. had. And so that's why we need to have more defense funding. We need to build up our, our ability to withstand a Soviet first strike. And then Ellsberg goes on to say, we found out later on that, yes, indeed, there was a missile gap, but it was in our favor. That actually it was just based on crazy Kremlin reports that they had intercepted and that, no, the Soviets didn't have 10 times as many missiles as we did. We had more missiles, of course, that our system, we can produce more with our resources. And, and then Ellsberg goes on to say, I didn't put this part in, but he goes on to say how, but that didn't seem to change anyone's consensus in terms of the need for more, for higher budgets that they still thought, well, you know, why take chances? Let's have 100 times more missiles than those guys do. So, um, so, you know, I had included that thinking that here was a way to sort of congratulate ourselves and to say that, look, you know, it's, it's a good thing that we fought the Cold War and a good thing we had Ronald Reagan leading us, but it turned out we didn't even, you know, we, we were going to kick their butt anyway if it ever came down to, to a fight. And, and like I said, they took that out. So I think that was the one part where I had tried to sort of get the conservatives to, to see the inner tension in their own views. Um, let me, let's see, I've got about 10 minutes left. Let me spend five minutes, because I think some of you thought I was going to talk about anarchy, so I'll talk about it really quickly. Um, it was with, with Hoppe not being here this week, you're, you're missing out on, the, on that part of the... Because really, I think that the advertisements, it should be Mises University, where libertarians become anarchists. That's really what I think this, this conference should be called. Um, so let me just very quickly go through some of the, the arguments, and then I'll take questions for the last five minutes or so. When it comes to anarcho-capitalism or what you might call market anarchy. The thing to remember, if you, if you have a solid base, if you're a libertarian with a small L and you understand the arguments for privatizing education or privatizing roads or privatizing um, the post office, if you understand those arguments, it's very easy to then extrapolate them to these other areas. And the first time you do it, it's going to sound just like an analogy and it's cute and aha, yeah, I can see how somebody could think that, but you're going to have reservations and think, but in the real world, that would never work. That would be crazy. And, and it's, that's why I say it's instructive with the war on terror to just, it really drives home the fact that no, the government, the types of mistakes that the government makes in these other areas, and it would just be better if the government kept its hands off the issue in the first place and let spontaneous forces play out, uh, it, it really just reinforces that, that come, that's 
the same thing is true when it comes to military issues. So when it comes to when you say, well, privatizing the military, people will say, well, you know, what, how exactly would that work? And very briefly, I think one obvious route would be you'd have insurance companies. And so what they would do is they would insure against earthquakes and heart attacks and things like that, fire for your house. And one thing they would insure against is what happens if an enemy uh, aggressor comes in from, from outside a military foreign power comes in and blows up your house with a bomb. Well, insurance companies could offer policies against that, just like they offer against earthquakes or fire. And that's where I think, in, in terms of a modern economy, a sophisticated Western nation like the United States, that's how I view a lot of the defense money being generated, that insurance companies would be the ones paying for it. Ultimately, of course, they would get the revenue from uh, property owners paying their premiums on insurance policies, but I think the people who would actually be ordering uh, military jets and, and things like that are, are buying services from defense agencies, I think the actual customer would be big insurance companies and they might have policies over all the houses in a certain region or particularly major coastal cities like Manhattan and other places like that. Surely some of the major property owners would get together, they'd have insurance and they would provide incentive for them to fund military defense. Now again, I've got to be very brief. One big objection to this is people say, well, that wouldn't raise enough money because you've got the free rider problem. And so my, my quick response to that, there's a couple of things you could say. One is that even if it's true that private voluntary contributions to providing military defense don't have the advantage that you can't use the government to force everyone to contribute, even if you don't have that option, nonetheless, there's an offsetting difference, which is that the, um, the prices that the Pentagon has to pay for military hardware, I think, are inflated several times because there's no competition. So in other words, what the Pentagon pays for um, an anti-aircraft battery or what they pay for a cruise missile or a, a stealth bomber is much more than what I think firms in the free market would have to pay for comparable equipment or, in fact, equipment that would perform much better because it would be an open competition. It wouldn't be just corrupt relationships between the, the government and military contractors. So that's one offsetting thing that, yeah, maybe they could spend one one hundredth of what the government spends in its military budget, but at the same time, they would have to pay perhaps one fiftieth of the prices for comparable hardware. And the other advantage is that the anarcho-capitalist community doesn't need to police the world, right? They don't need to have aircraft carriers overseas. They don't need to have hundreds of thousands of troops garrisoned across the world. All they need to do is make it just prohibitively costly to try to invade them. They don't even have to make it so that they would win the war in a sense. They just have to make it the case that nobody in his right mind is going to try to take us over because it's just going to be too painful. The same way that the Nazis didn't take over Switzerland during World War II. They could have if they wanted to, but what was the point? Switzerland wasn't posing a threat to them. And, you know, there were, as, as um, one of my Russian professors at Hillsdale used to say, he said, these people they have tanks in their garages. Oh, they're crazy. No one would ever invade them, right? That, I don't know if that's true, but he was claiming that he went to this, his buddy's house and the guy had a tank like, in, with plastic over in his garage. He, he, he really, I'm not making up that he claimed that. I don't know if it's true. All right, so now it comes to private law. And so, yeah, I think in two minutes I can do private law. Um, <laughs> hang on. Okay. Um, so the private legal system, again, to use the analogy, I think privatizing the military is really, it, it's straightforward. It's, it's, not, it's just like privatizing education or other so-called public goods. It's, it's really not that hard to think. The thing that's really tricky is to try to figure out if we didn't have this sort of collective arrangement where we all decide as a community what the law is going to be, you know, where the heck are these our, our, our rules going to come from? Where, where's property rights going to come from? Who's going to define what these things are? As Milton Friedman says, you need the government to define the rules of the game, and then you, know, you go ahead and let people transact freely among those rules. But you need some monopolistic agency to define the thing in the first place. And no, that's, that's not true. And just to see it, there's all sorts of arenas where we see that that's not true. When it comes to the spoken language, for example, there's no group of people who decide what the rules of grammar are, or they de decide what the definitions of English words are. Nobody decides that, or in a sense, we all decide it through our, our usage. You might say that the writers of dictionaries or of style books define what the rules of, of writing are and definitions, but no, they don't. If Webster published a dictionary and it said, you know, next to the word up, um, you know, tending towards the floor, 
it wouldn't be that all of a sudden they changed. No, they just got it wrong. That they, so the writers of dictionaries, they just codify what the rules are as practiced by the people in society. And so by the same token, I think people writing the, the law books in an anarcho-capitalist community, they would just be codifying um, the prevailing customs and usages as they were uh, playing out. And the last thing I'll say on this, and I'll have time for probably two questions, is the, the basic mechanism that I think would happen, how would law be promulgated, where would the, the precedent be set, is there would be private judges. And they wouldn't, so, so people would have conflicts. You know, somebody would, would, would throw a party at 3 a.m. and I would think that, no, he shouldn't have the right to do that. It's interfering with my sleep. And he said, no, it's my property. So people have conflicts. How do they settle it? Well, they would go to people who over time had just shown they make wise decisions and their job would be to render their opinion on something. And in, in a community, I think, where everything was voluntary, there would eventually arise a demand for these services. So you could go to an expert in this matter and you could present your case and he might say, yeah, the way the community, I've ruled on similar cases and yeah, past 3 a.m. you can't be throwing parties like that in this type of arrangement. And so then the, the aggrieved party could say to the other person, I want you to, to stop doing what you're doing. And if he didn't, he could then say to the community, look what I've done. I've gone to this reputable judge. We all know the fairness of his past rulings and he's agreeing with me. So this guy over here is an outcast, right? And, we, and you, know, you can talk about should you have the right to be able to use force and, and that's a whole different issue. But the point is where would the, the legal rules come from? I think they would ultimately come from judges just giving decisions. And again, the ones who would get authority in quotation marks perhaps to, to render such verdicts would be the ones who over time people voluntarily submitted their cases to. Okay, why don't we have two questions? Yep. I said, no, it's not. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, you, you could just go through, I mean, you can point out all the ways that, I mean, Ron Paul's great thing against uh, Giuliani, I think he did a great job of summarizing all the things the U.S. has done to provoke people. And I, um, again, I'm not going to be able to do it justice right now in one minute, but I think you could just go through and list all the different ways the U.S. is intervening and has caused people to hate us. And, I don't think it's the case. You know, you could say, well, these people aren't necessarily attacking other countries. They really hate the U.S. And it's, I think, because the U.S. has come to stand for an imperialist power. And you can list all the, the troops we have all over the place, all of our military bases, that it's, it's really not the case that we've just been sitting in our borders minding our own business and all of a sudden these nut jobs attack us. Yeah. Um, he, he watched Office Space, so I don't know. Okay, I think it's time for dinner, so thanks a lot.